Assalamu alaikum and welcome to a brand new episode of Roundup. Unfortunately, Ghani isn't with us here today, but not to worry, as he'll be here next week, inshallah. But without further ado, let's see what we have coming up in today's episode. Coming up, we start with a report on the standoff between Iran and Israel as the threat of war looms. Then we head to Australia for another trip to the Australian Mint. And finally, we delve into the world of books at the Calgary Public Library. That's all coming up just a bit later in the episode, but as always, let's head over to Rashman to see what's in the headlines this week. Assalamu alaikum Rashman. What's in the news? Wa alaikum assalam Nasir Bay. We start with the United Nations, where the United States vetoed a resolution that would have recognized a Palestinian state on Thursday. The draft resolution recommended to the 193-member UN General Assembly that the State of Palestine should be admitted to the membership in the UN. Britain and Switzerland abstained, while the rest of the 12 council members voted yes. The Palestinians are currently a non-member observer state. An application to become a full UN member needs to be approved by the Security Council and at least two-thirds of the General Assembly. The US says an independent Palestinian state should be established through direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. A record storm saw a year's rainfall in one day in the United Arab Emirates on Tuesday. The storm first hit Oman on Sunday before flooding roads and causing gridlock on Tuesday. Rainwater flooded homes and businesses, cutting off power and killed 21 people. The lack of drainage infrastructure made it even more difficult for the region to cope with the heavy rains. Rain is rare in the UAE, which is typically known for its dry desert climate. Climate experts say rising temperatures caused by human-led climate change are leading to more extreme weather events around the world. The countdown has begun for the 2024 Summer Olympic Games in Paris. With 100 days to go as of last Wednesday, preparations are in full swing. The opening ceremony is scheduled for July 26th and will take place on River Seine with athletes travelling through the city by boats. Competitions will be held at Paris landmarks like the Eiffel Tower and the Palace of Versailles. Officials are working on alternative options of the opening ceremony, considering potential terrorist attacks and security concerns. Jazakallah Nasir Bait, that's all for me this week. Jazakallah Arshman for the latest on the top stories from around the world. Now let's head over to Rahel to get the latest Friday sermon summary from this week. Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters and welcome to this week's Friday sermon discussion. Today we're diving into the rich history of Islam, exploring the lessons we can learn from the Battle of Uhud and the expedition of Hamra al-Asad. Let's start with the Battle of Uhud. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, faced not only physical injury, but also the loss of loved ones and companions. Yet, amidst his own pain, he showed compassion and empathy towards others. He consoled the families of the martyrs, praying for them to have excellent guardians. This teaches us the importance of empathy and support during difficult times. The Holy Prophet's interactions with Hamna bin Jash May Allah be pleased with her, also offer valuable insights. Her grief at the loss of her husband shows the deep bond between spouses. This reminds us to treat our partners with love and kindness always, as the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, emphasized. Moving on to mourning, the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, discouraged excessive wailing and self-harm as expressions of grief. Instead, he encouraged a dignified way of mourning, showing respect for both the deceased and the living. It's a lesson for us to handle our emotions with patience and dignity, even in times of sorrow. The swords used in battle were also significant. The Holy Prophet وسلم, honored each one, ensuring no one's contribution was overlooked. This teaches us the importance of acknowledging and appreciating the efforts of others, even in challenging situations. Finally, let's talk about the expedition of Hamra al-Asad. After the Battle of Uhud, the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, remained vigilant, anticipating further threats to Medina. 
His foresight and preparedness save the city from potential harm. It's a reminder for us to always be vigilant and prepared for any challenges we may face. As we reflect on these historical events, let's also remember the appeal for prayers made by beloved Hazur, may Allah strengthen his hands in today's world. Where conflicts threaten us to escalate, it's crucial for us to pray for peace and wisdom for all leaders and communities. That's all the time we have for today. Remember, history offers us valuable lessons to learn from. Let's strive to embody the compassion, empathy and wisdom of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam in our lives. Until next time, Assalamu Alaikum. JazakAllah Khair for the latest on this week's Friday Sermon. As always, be sure to watch the sermon in its entirety on any of MTA's various platforms. As we heard in this week's Friday Sermon, Beloved Hadur Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Asil Aziz instructed us once again to pray for the state of the world as the escalation of tensions continues in the Middle East. Let's have a look at what has happened in these past few days. In the past week, tensions escalated in the Middle East as Iran launched an attack on Israel in retaliation for an incident earlier this month. Here's a detailed look at what unfolded. Iran unleashed a barrage of missiles and drones targeting Israel, marking the first direct strike from Iranian soil. The attack began on Saturday evening and lasted for about five hours. Explosions were heard in cities across Israel as air raid sirens sounded in over 720 locations. Israel's military reported that the attack involved over 120 ballistic missiles, 170 drones and 30 cruise missiles. While most projectiles were intercepted, some minor damage occurred and several people were injured, including a seven-year-old girl. I think it was quite scary when in the middle of the night we started hearing booming and we didn't know what it was. I mean, we knew what it was. We don't extend it. We don't know what extent it would be. But thank God the Israeli army came through and... So far it's quiet and we hope we'll continue like this. I really hope it won't be a big war now. None of us in Israel want a big war. Um, so I hope that's it and I hope Iran will stop now. Um, I imagine it, uh, Israel will respond because I mean our whole country was covered in missiles and drones. So uh, what can you do? But we have to stop it somehow. So why did Iran attack? Iran's attack was in retaliation for a suspected Israeli strike that occurred on April 1st in Damascus which killed an Iranian military commander and several others. Israel's Prime Minister assured the nation of preparedness, but was divided on how to respond. Meanwhile, Iran warned against any retaliation, threatening a larger response if provoked further. The international community, including the US, UN and G7, has called for restraint and dialogue to prevent further conflict. Iran launched a barrage of missiles and attack drones across the Middle East towards Israel. This was a dangerous and unnecessary escalation which I've condemned in the strongest terms. Thanks to an international coordinated effort which the United Kingdom participated in, almost all of these missiles were intercepted, saving lives not just in Israel but in neighbouring countries like Jordan as well. The RAF sent additional planes to the region as part of our existing operations to counter Daesh in Iraq and Syria. I can confirm that our planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones and I want to pay tribute to the bravery and professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger to protect civilians. Many are concerned about the possibility of a regional war, while others remain hopeful for de-escalation. Here's a closer look at the potential outcomes. Gideon Levy, an Israeli journalist, believes that if Israel were to strike back, it could lead to a regional war. However, he also mentioned the significant support Israel received from the United States, suggesting that Israel might listen to US advice to avoid retaliation. Analysts fear the dangers of a regional conflict, not only for the Middle East, but also for the global community. The situation in the Middle East remains tense, with the possibility of further escalation looming. However, efforts are underway to prevent further conflict and promote dialogue between the involved parties. It's crucial for everyone to stay informed and hopeful for peace in the region. Jazakallah for that. It really is a troubling time that we are living in and we should increase our prayers as instructed. Now, a bit of a lighter mood, before Ramadan we took a trip through the Australian Mint to give you an insight into how the country's money is made. Well, we've now got a part two of this fascinating trip to show you. So, let's have a look.
welcome back everyone. If you have just joined us, we're in the midst of an exclusive tour at the Royal Australian Mint, unravelling the secrets behind the creation of Australian coins. In our previous episode, we explored the establishment of the Mint, took a peek inside the factory and learnt about the fascinating collaboration between robots and humans in the coin making process. Today we continue our journey with more insight from the Royal Australian Mint. So let us dive right back in. So this right here is our proof and uncirculated room and this is where we make all of our collector coins. So down the factory floor, obviously we make proof coins, and those are the actual coins with gold and silver in them. So these are all done by hand right here. If you come a bit closer, you'll notice that right on the factory floor, we've got some proof coins being made right now. So what will happen is a worker will put in a blank, which is basically a coin without any images in them, pop it inside, machine will stamp it four to six times to ensure the best quality possible, and if it's bad at the end, we'll chuck it out, we'll make it into a new blank, and we want to make sure that these coins are perfect. Over on the left hand side, now, so we've got a machine uh, called our Grabner machine, and that's where we make all of our uncirculated coins. So those are still really special coins. They don't have actual gold and silver inside them, um, but these uh, have some really special uh, images on them. It has a special polish on it to make sure it's nice and shiny. We make those at about one per second. The Royal Australian Mint, located in Canberra, the capital of Australia, plays a central role in producing Australia's circulating coins. It's a place where precision, technology and craftsmanship come together. So the next time you grab a coin out of your pocket, take some time to think about what kind of a journey that small piece of metal has made. I hope you enjoyed this behind the scenes tour and gained a newfound appreciation of the coins we use every day. Jazakallah to our team in Australia for that fascinating report. Now let's go all the way around the world to the other side, Canada where our team is taking us deep into the world of books with a visit to the Calgary Public Library. Assalamu alaikum. Today, I'm going to take you to one of my favorite places. Can you guess where we are? We are at Calgary Central Library. Did you know that Libraries and books being easily available is actually one of the prophecies mentioned in the Holy Quran. And that books play a really, really important role in spreading the message of Islam and Ahmadiyyat throughout the world. We know that libraries have books, but did you also know that they contain so much more? This library has art exhibits, a theater, a children's area, a recording studio, board games, puzzles, video games, and all of it is free. Look around, see what an awesome space it is. Every day, this library has more than 3,300 visitors. It's not surprising to find out that the building has won many international design and engineering awards and that people flock to see it from around the world, making it one of the major tourist attractions in Calgary. It even made the New York Times list of 52 must-see places to visit around the world, as well as earning praise for being one of the most futuristic libraries in the world. Take a look at the inner spaces, which are made from red cedar wood, specially brought from the province next door to Alberta, British Columbia. These amazing wooden arches are the largest freeform structure of this type in the world. One of its amazing features is it is built over an existing light rail system. A part of the library is like a bridge and train can go under it. The outside of the library is designed with geometric glass panels to provide openness and light. The layout and plan were actually chosen in a special contest to find the best design for a job. A Swedish and a local company won the competition to design the space. The challenge was to design a fun to serious place that would be appealing to a wide variety of people with different needs. The library is built in such a way where the lower levels 
are lively and fun with lots of hustle bustle, and the upper levels are more serious like quiet study spaces. This library also has historical archives and really, really old maps of Calgary. The Calgary Public Library System is one of the most used library systems in North America. More than half of the people who live here are members of the library. Before we head out, let me just borrow some books to keep me busy for the next few weeks. Happy reading! Jazakallah to our team in Canada for showing us around the Calgary Public Library. That's all we have time for in today's episode, but not to worry, as we'll be back next week with a lot more exciting content from all around the world. Make sure to follow us on our social media channels, both Instagram and Twitter, if you haven't already. We've got lots of great behind the scenes content for you all, as well as all the information you need for our upcoming episodes. But until then, Assalamu Alaikum. Yeah.